I have one question for everyone on this review today. Who wants to count with Elias? We'll tell you as WGS TV reviews Monday Night Raw for the week of March 26, 2018. Hey YouTube, are you ready for your hot tag? Because if you are, it's definitely time to work. Hi, you're watching the Wrestle Gamer on WGS TV. I'm the Russell Gamer. Welcome back to another episode of WGS TV right here on YouTube.com slash Russell Gamer. Joining me on the review this week, once again, ladies and gentlemen, is the Stubbly Man Ashley. Ashley, how you doing? Good. <laughs> Sorry, it should be longer than that, but yeah, I'm doing good. Going into Raw this week, there were a few things I wanted to see. One was seeing how they were going to further the angle of Lesnar and Reigns and whether or not it would be a sellable angle for what they were trying to push. Another big thing I was expecting to see was whether or not we would see some kind of response or appearance from The Undertaker with WrestleMania coming up in a couple of weeks. So let's get down to the nitty gritty and talk about Raw. Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman would kick off Raw by ragging and bragging about Roman Reigns and what happened between them last week. Heyman would also make the remark that Reigns was there and that he was always the person that said that he was there every week. Much to their dismay, Reigns would appear through the crowd and picked up a chair but was quickly taken down by the Universal Champion. However, Reigns would quickly get the advantage with several steel chair shots to the, to the Universal Champion but would make the fatal mistake of leaving himself open as he went for the Superman punch, which Lesnar countered into a belly-to-belly -belly suplex on the floor. Lesnar would, Lesnar would get in a few chair shots himself and would leave Reigns laying in the middle of the ring with an F5 to the steel steps. Personal opinion? Ashley, this is the one thing I think WWE really needs to think about, and that was the fact that the fans were cheering for Lesnar while he was beating down Reigns. Mm-hmm. Because it's the spectacle and everything of all that happened. And because Roman is never going to get uh, over. That's even the right phrase. But the question is, in this angle, they've been they've been trying to push Reigns as the face and Lesnar as the heel, and so far, just based on the reaction from last night, they're not doing the they're not doing the job. They're they're spinning it in such a way to try and get the casual fans. The problem is <clears throat> because of the ticket prices. There will obviously still be casual fans at Mania, but most of them will be watching online. The people who will be going are the hardcores. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but I'm still and like... those are the people that are not going to be that easy to sway. Oh, yeah, definitely. Fans like us to be, you know, for example. But um, I'm going to go ahead and score the opening segment a 3 out of 5, Ash. Yeah, I'd say that. Uh... Solid segment for what it was. It, it it tried to do the whole deal that Roan Reigns is actually going to be there every week, yeah. unless he tells another drugs test. <laughs> Opening match this week was Nia Jax taking on Mickey James. First thing, if Mickey James is in the match, then why didn't she get her an entrance instead of Alexa Bliss? I know it's nitpicking, but still, Bliss wasn't in the match. Now, for the most part, Nia used her power to dominate Mickey until the match slipped to the outside when Bliss distracted Jax and James chop blocked Jax. Jax, however, uh, James, however, left herself open when she went up to the top turnbuckle, only to be plucked off it by Jax with a gorilla press into a Samoan drop. I know, scary, actual move terminology. They don't do that in WWE. It's shocking. But uh, anyway, after the match, Bliss would sneak in a cheap shot towards her opponent at Challenger at WrestleMania, but it didn't phase her. Personal opinion, the question I have, Ashley, is can Jax get herself over as a face in this angle? She's doing all right so far. Because let's be honest, that the, the gimmick of the heel is a bit typecast. 
I like the fact that we're trying to actually have a larger person with sympathy because the only reason she's getting sympathy and to some extent Alexa's getting sympathy is because they're forcing this whole yeah she's fat as Scott Steiner would say um <laughs> angle on it all um then again for what she went through with you know that person that we can't name in the storyline for the in the cruiserweight stuff that never came to be because you know he didn't want to inform the company about being investigated on rape issues um yeah. but, but let me ask you this question does a face Nia Jax have sustainability on Monday Night Raw depending who she's up against possibly I mean I'm guessing there'll probably be a Bliss rematch possibly for Backlash or whatever but it depends who goes up against the only person I can think of that could go up against the river considering what happened later on in the show which we'll get to is Sasha yeah that... but then I partly don't want to see that again because we saw that too many times yeah, but anyway, I'm going to score that match a 3.15 out of 5. What do you think, Ash? Two and a half. It sort of just... It didn't really do anything. Especially for Bitch, which they couldn't even censor properly. Yeah, they messed up on that one big time. Uh, WWE would air a video package of Triple H and Stephanie McMahon training in the gym, and we'll talk about how Ronda Rousey should be intimidated by Stephanie, and that Ronda was entering a world she knew nothing about. Triple H would also remark that he's been beating up Kurt Angle his whole career and has no qualms about doing it at WrestleMania. So basically, it was just them putting themselves over for the, their WrestleMania match. Pretty much cut and dry, Ash, wouldn't you think? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, dear God, <laughs> Stephanie is so disgenuine in her promo. She's trying to make the big talk, and she just sounds like somebody that really doesn't know what they're doing which considering that she's supposed to be like a de facto sort of new boss of the company to some extent even though obviously Vince is still chairman and signs off on everything as long yeah. as Triple H takes over the actual running of like backstage we're good because from what I heard some of the creative stuff that she came up with the one rumor that's now going around is WWE wants somebody to be gay, even though they're not gay, to portray a gay wrestler. Weren't they sort of doing that with Darren Young? No, they want to do it fake because they don't want to be genuine. No. <laughs> I also apologize. <laughs> I also apologize to the viewers and subscribers, but there are a few segments from WWE which they had no stills for me to grab. So, and one of them was the video package. So I do apologize for not having that on the screen for you guys to see. But um, up next, the final four men in the Cruiserweight Championship match at WrestleMania will be featured in a tag team match as Mustafa Ali and Cedric Alexander took on Drew Gulak and TJP with 205 Live General Manager Rockstar Spud, aka Drake Maverick, on commentary. And for the most part, he was there to put over the Cruiserweight Championship match and 205 Live. Now, for the most part in this match, it was the Cruiserweights showcasing what they do best in the ring. Gulak and TJP worked over Ali for several minutes before making the hot tag to Cedric, who took it to both Gulak and TJP. Ali would then take a take out Gulak with a somersault to the outside, and then Ali would make the tag to Cedric before he hit the lumbar check on TJP. Then Ali took the chance to hit the 054, the imported 450, on TJP to pick up the win for his team. Personal opinion? It was a good match for the most part, but Ashley, they got very little reaction from the crowd, don't you think? Yeah, because they, they didn't expect it to happen. That's the thing. It's like, I mean, what do you do? You're not expecting cruiserweights because you haven't had them on the show for, what, seven weeks? Because you're trying to rebrand 205 Live Show as a good show? So as soon as you bring it back on to the main thing, the people that just watch the main thing and they're going to go, what are these fuckers back on here for? 
despite the fact if they actually got the network and watched it, they'll realise that that show under the Triple H Drake Maverick era is probably some of the best stuff that's happening now on a consistent basis. And how about the ever, commentary? Ever since that, ever since that first round, for you know the first set of matches from the first round, what right after the Rumble was it? Yeah. When Drake got appointed GM, it's been a really, really good show where Raw and SmackDowns had hits of misses aplenty. Whereas every match has built right to what they need to do. There's been some really good matches as well that have gone under the radar. You know, the semi-finals alone of Cedric Roderick Strong and Gulak Ali have been really good. Um, I bet Neville now regrets <laughs> his <he> fitting. <laughs> yeah, I would think. But, um, uh... I also got to say, commentary on 205 Live is really good as well. Oh, yeah, well, you know, it's Nigel McGuinness. Then again, you know, he's British, so... Super biased! Yeah, and, I, and I'm also biased towards actually good commentary, because if the commentary is good, it adds to the entertainment and the flavor of the match, but if commentary is bad, it takes away from that. So... I gotta say, I'm also a stickler for that. So when commentary is good, that at least makes the match enjoyable for me. But as for the actual tag team match on Raw, I'm gonna give it a three out of five, Ash. Mm-hmm. I'd say, yeah. I'd agree with you with that. It, it, it's it, it, it should have been given more time, but because it's Vince, it, it wasn't. But it. It, it, I mean, they've got, I guess, to do some some sort of main card build to the match at Mania, even if it is on the pre-show. But, you know, who knows? Yep. Up next, it was The Miz and The Miz Taraj with Miz TV. First off, Miz took a shot at his hometown crowd by saying that he lives in LA now, which, of course, was genius in my opinion. If you're a heel in your hometown, what better way to get heat from them than by slamming them on the mic right from the get-go? Miz would then voice his displeasure with the performance of the Miztourage when Seth Rollins came out in an attempt to, what he said, mediate the dispute between them. At one point, Bo Dallas would then blurt out that Miz was a, quote, phony A-lister who couldn't fight and would reiterate it uh, again when pushed by Finn Balor. Miz would then make the comment that he's 33 days away from being the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time, better than Shawn Michaels, and then the comment that would sting Curtis Axel, better than Mr. Perfect. Mitt Siraj would then have a standoff with their boss and back them up to Balor and Rollins when the Mitt Siraj struck and attacked Balor and Rollins, and for a short period of time they had the numbers advantage, that is, until Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson made the save and came after the Mitt Siraj, which left Miz on his own as Rollins struck back. Balor and Rollins would have a short standoff until Balor pushed Rollins out of the way and took down Miz with a sling blade and then Balor would strike on Rollins with the very same move. Personal opinion? I actually, I don't know how many times I have to repeat this, but I personally believe Miz is one of the best heels on Raw today. Oh, easy. Easy. Just because, you know, he's in his hometown. Oh, no, but I live in L.A. Just from that to the work that he did in terms of, um, you know, trying to say, oh, look, descent in the ranks. Yeah, what what are Mr. Oz doing? And then, of course, the swerve, which sort of was inevitable and whatever, but um, I still enjoyed it. Um, what resulted from it though was just felt like what we should get next week as part of the go home show but I guess that's what happens when you build too early and you have to do three or four straight weeks of <clears throat> three or four straight weeks of uh, 
as if it's the like last show before Raw. Who knows? I dare anyone well, right now. Mania. I'm I'm sorry, Ash. Before Mania, I mean, not before Raw. Yeah. <laughs> I dare anyone to find someone better to hate than the Miz. And don't say Reigns because Reigns is not a heel. You may hate Reigns, but that doesn't mean his character is a heel. I mean, I hate Lesnar. Do I think Lesnar is a heel because of it? Think about that, guys. However, I'm going to score that whole segment actually at 3.25 out of 5. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll probably agree with you. Up next, it was the Empress of Tomorrow, Asuka, taking on local jobber Jamie Frost. Ashley, uh, what can you tell us from what you found out about just who Jamie Frost is? Um, so it's interesting. Her name is... Um, hang on, let's see if I can get the name. Uh, I need to go to her Twitter. Oh, that's a different... Jamie Frost. I forgot. Um, <laughs> I, I forgot. She changed her profile name to Jamie Frost, even though she isn't. Uh, the Platinum Aggressive Lady Ellie Fredericks. She's on the indies. Um, the only way is that I can guess she was picked up. One, somebody tweeted at Road Dog saying she looks like a new next generation Sherry Martell. Which, to some extent, facially she does. The hair obviously isn't right because it's short and blonde, but... Um... You know, I've actually met I, Sherry Martel's son. I'd say that... Okay. That was a swerve. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um... But I'd say that probably the obvious place was the fact that... Uh, apparently, for the first time ever, they actually had indie wrestling as part of the Arnold Classic. And given, you know, Arnold Classic, Triple H, the shits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's his shit, you know. Um, that's his crack. Um, he means butt. I've, I've got a... F no, that's his sort of, like, drug. Well, that's his drug. That's what he's into. Okay. You know? I think he's been on the judging panel for, like, the last two years. Really? I didn't know that. Uh, he certainly was last year. I don't know if he was for this year, but certainly Triple H was there in some capacity because you know pictures with uh, Schwarzenegger and all that. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if they went. I like the look of you. Uh, do you want a job to ask her in thirty seconds? Uh, <laughs> that's literally how long the match went. Uh, yep essentially because Frost would cut a promo on the outside saying that Asuka wasn't ready for her. Frost would go on the attack but nope. it wouldn't phase the first ever women's Royal Rumble winner as all it took was one straight kick to the head of Frost for her to pick up the win. Personal opinion, anytime Asuka's on WWE television is great to me, even the Mixed Max Challenge. I'm, I'm going to score that a 3.35 out of 5, Ash. I have to say it's a two because it's like one, why is she on the brand still, Asuka, when we know she isn't even in the blooming title match for Raw? Why, should, why can't she just be on the other brand? And two, what did this hype for Charlotte? That Asuka can beat mere mortals in, what, like 20 seconds? Something like that. Maybe you guys can tell us in the comments what you think about that. But uh, backstage, and again, I do apologize for having no stills for this part. Bailey and Sasha Banks would finally have the physical confrontation between each other that's been building up over the past several weeks. But the issue I have with this, Ashley, is that they finally broke them up. But essentially, neither one of them turned heel. So what was the point of teasing a turn with both of them? Well, I don't think they did because Bailey was making more sort of face style points that Sasha couldn't take. But then the, then the other thing you can think about is 
Sasha's good as a heel. We know that. Ha hasn't been so great as a baby face. We know that. But Bailey's career as a face is all but dead because the fans don't give a damn about her anymore. Yeah, when she first got on the scene, they would, they would also sing that song that uh, Bailey, Won't You Be My Girl? And they would do it like week after week, and then it just slowly started dying out. And the hype because around they her. Mis because, because they mismanaged her. Because they should have had her win the title at WrestleMania. Instead, they decided to randomly put do it at Fastlane, the show before, which meant all the hype of excitement at WrestleMania went to, oh look, Charlotte wins lol. Because mm. apparently nobody can keep a title belt. Yeah, apparently. But then again, and then these the are whole, just our thoughts. You know, Alexa burial burying her not helping the matters again it, it just falls to that thing that i've always said about when current nxt stars are great on nxt and then they get moved up to the main roster and then they get lost in what i card called the mid card shuffle <laughs> bailey has just fallen into the cracks of that and it's just a shame because she she's more talented than they're giving her credit for right now on the main roster and then, mm -hmm. and they could do so much more with her, but I, I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Vince McMahon has lost the plot. He lost it a long time ago, and if he still thinks that the product he's putting out right now is beating up to satisfactory standards with today's wrestling fans, then he needs to be back on Geritol Medicine and put in a retirement home, because that's where he needs to be. Because that's where this product is going if Vince McMahon doesn't get his head out of his ass. But the, Geritol the, Medicine provided by Geritron 5000. Yeah, but then again, these are just my opinions, guys. You may have a different opinion about it, but this is what we do here at WGS-TV. We uh, like to have a discussion and have different opinions thrown out there. Up next, it was Braun Strowman taking on one half of the bar in Sheamus. The bar would demand to know who Strowman's partner was for their tag team title match at WrestleMania. Hint, hint, on commentary, they kept saying that Strowman doesn't have a partner, but on the microphone, Strowman said he had a partner and it said that he would tell them if Sheamus could beat him. And for the most part, it was Strowman having his way with the Celtic Warrior, despite several moments in the match when he had the advantage thanks to Cesaro causing distraction after distraction. Strowman would put away Sheamus with Power Slam to pick up the win. Personal opinion, WWE is really leaving us in the dark as to who Strowman's partner actually is. And you know what, Ashley? I like that idea. It puts an air of mystery to it. Yeah. Because I've, I've just read, well, considering everything that may have got indicated, I don't know whether Elias is actually going to be the person. Which... made me realize hmm should we even bring up Elias in the snicker commercial that we saw last night <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> oh my if that guys, was awesome if, if you guys didn't see it you know snickers has been known for doing commercials where you know you're this if you're hungry like if you know you're not you if you're hungry or you're confused when you're hungry and they did a version of that with Elias because you know how Elias normally says who wants to walk with Elias he was instead in a classroom singing who wants to count with Elias and saying you're just not you if you're hungry <laughs> and I'm like wow that was actually funny but, yeah, uh, for sure. But anyway, for the match with Strowman and Sheamus, actually, I'm giving it a 3.15 out of 5. Uh, 3, because... Well, no, not I'd say like a 2.75, just because Sheamus is clearly working injured. He is not starting to look in, not in any fit shape to sort of do anything. Did Strowman do anything to his knee? Because he kind of noticeably tweaked his knee a little bit last night. Not that I'm aware of. Hmm. Well, but, I figured I'd just bring know, that up. Might have. 
Well, up next, Kurt Angle and Ron Ronda Rousey cut a promo, and when it comes to Rousey, I use that term loosely about their upcoming match with Triple H and Stephanie at WrestleMania when they would get interrupted by Absolution. Paige would then cut a promo that was pretty much similar to the one she did on Sasha Banks a couple of weeks ago, that you need friends to have you back and that Kurt Angle didn't have her back, and Paige wanted her to become the fourth member of Absolution, to which Rousey declined. Paige then sent in Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville to attack Rousey, but Rousey was able to fend, them, fend off the both of them. I did like Rousey's takedown into the armbar on Rose, and that was nicely done. Personal opinion? I know Rousey has her fanboys, but listening to her cut a promo right now, Ashley, is painful. And the only reason she's going to WrestleMania this year, in my opinion, is solely because of her name. Yeah. The, the fact of the matter is she's better than some of the wrestlers, though, <laughs> on promo stuff. Because obviously, keep in mind, she never really did work the mic or try and get really sort of verbally involved in promos anyway in the UFC. <clears throat> I mean, the fact that she very rarely did interviews, especially after she lost, when she lost. I'm intrigued as if she, if she loses when we actually get to sort of WrestleMania stuff, is she just not going to show up the next night because she doesn't want to talk about it? I lost. You won't see me for two months. I'm Brock Lesnar. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, something like that. Maybe I don't. You know. Well, I don't know. I'll give the segment some credit, and I'll give it a two point nine five out of five. Um, I have to give it a one, just because. Absolution are not relevant. Paige needs to be with somebody else. Because Sonya is green as goose shit. Mandy is... Dark green as goose shit. As in she isn't as green. I don't know. <laughs> um, <sighs> the thing with Sonya was terrible. I was actually wanting Ronda to break her arm in real life. Because, you know, Sonya's supposed to be from an MMA background, Kiva. So it's like, why wasn't she the one that had her arm nearly broken? Why did it have to be Mandy? Then again, whatever that ju that judo toss was that Mandy did with Sonya being in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Dear God, that was a great botch. But then it was followed up. Which I guess means I can't give it a one. I have to give it a two. Because this, gi this gives an extra whole point. That sword throw into the armbar transition, yeah, was beautiful. Yes, yeah. So and then and then when she was going to go all Pentagon Junior, Pentarel Zero Miedo, as in I'm gonna break your arm, I'm gonna break your arm, I'm gonna break your arm, and Kurt's just like no, and she just goes oh, okay, boss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But it was, you can see at that angle, the idea, it, like when Brock did it, it's going to be the whole, you're going to get, I mean, you're not going to be able to hear her when the bone cracks, if only. I mean, I'm not wishing harm on her, but I want to make it look like it's a lot of harm, because, well, I guess I don't, because then that'll mean that Stephanie gets over more, and I don't want that, because I thought the idea is to get Ronda over, rather than put over the person that owns the company. Oh, wait, that's what the match is at. It's, the match, honestly, isn't for Ronda. It's trying to legitimize Stephanie on the mainstream stage. Yeah. Which is my problem, because all the mainstream stuff, you know, media is talking to Stephanie. Because Ronda isn't doing interviews. But then, of course, at the same time, she's trying to be the actual face of the company for real. So she can't do any of the stuff that she wants to. So it's like, awkward. In a beautiful way. Um... Take note, Rousey fanboys. We actually gave Ronda Rousey credit for doing something on Raw. 
Just saying. Just saying. Up next, it was Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson taking on the Miz Taraj. This was basically a sleeper match in a sense that the only reason this match was happening was due to the confrontation with them earlier in the night on Miz TV. But other than that, there was just no real interest in the match. And sadly, the only relevancy that Gallows and Anderson have right now is being a part of the Balor Club. And that just shows how inept Vince McMahon and WWE Creative is right now because they took a team that was on top in New Japan Pro Wrestling and done absolutely squat with them. I mean, look at what they did with the Ascension and how WWE's misused them. I've said it. I've said it already in, uh, on this review, and I'm gonna say it again. Vince lost the plot a long time ago, and if he actually believed his product is meeting with the satisfactory standards for today's wrestling fans, then he basically has no clue. He probably thinks it's still 1997, and he still, he still probably thinks he's part of the Attitude Era. That's, yeah, but that's just my thought. Vince has just fallen out of love at the minute with um, tag team wrestling. He doesn't give a damn about it. That's the main issue. Yeah. Too much. That's what needs to save it. Well, anyway, there is not much to this match as the finish was Gallows and Anderson hitting the Magic Killer on Axel to pick up the win. Personal opinion. Ash, I think I've already said what I needed to say about this. It was just filler. Essentially. Filler. It's two out of five. Mm-hmm. Speaking of fillers, up next it was Elias, who didn't apparently had his Snickers, taking on Rhino, who I guess thought we thought had his uh, cheese crackers. And just like with the previous tag team match, there's just not much to this match to talk about. Elias I forgot Rhino's music ever existed because he came out so many times to East Slater's music. I was like, wait, what's this music? And there's like, oh, I remember it now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Rhino can get his entrance, but Mickey James couldn't get hers. But anyway. Yeah, yeah she ain't like most girls. Oh, Eli well, that's Naya. <laughs> <laughs> Elias did his usual singing promo, dissing Cleveland, and would think about having his greatest performance at WrestleMania, or something to that extent. Rhino would have a short advantage on Elias, but in the end, it was Elias hitting the drift away on Rhino to pick up the win. As Slater was checking on his partner, Elias would strike again with the drift away on Slater. And, and then Coach said, I went to people on Twitter and asked who they thought Braun Strowman's partner is, and they want Elias. Which by default means Elias just lost his chance. Thanks, social media. You fucked him over. Personal <laughs> Unless opinion. he wins the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, in yeah. which case he's cursed for the next 12 months. Because have you seen everybody that's won that has been cursed in 12 months afterwards? Prime example, what Mojo Raleigh. To win? Mojo got cursed. Cesaro won. Corbin got cursed. Cesaro got cursed. Big Show got cursed. Yep. Well, it's like the Madden NFL front cover. The curse. <laughs> exactly. That's the best way to describe it right there. But uh, as far as the match goes, personal opinion, just like with the previous tag team match, time filler. Two. Exactly. Up next, it was the no disqualification match with John Cena taking on Kane. The match would quickly spill to the outside, where we saw some pretty awesome spots, like on the ramp with the steel steps, and Kane suplexing Cena onto the barricade that was set up by the stage. I think what really sold it for the fans was Cena mocking The Undertaker several times during the match, like with Cena doing The Undertaker sit-up, The Undertaker throat taunt, and even choke slamming the choke slamming Kane, which was pulled off quite nicely, so take that, Cena haters. However, that would not be enough to put away the Devil's Favorite Demon as Kane would rebound by sending Cena into a table that was set up in the corner. But like with the Dudley Boys, one table is never enough as another one was brought into play, but it would come back to bite Kane in the backside as Cena would hit the AA through the table to pick up the win. However, one thing to note about the match. No appearance from The Undertaker. Cena was begging for The Undertaker to do something, like lightning, a bell, lights flickering, to just do something. Personal opinion, I loved the match, but actually I was honestly expecting to see something from the dead man. They gave it enough time at the end where I thought, 
something was going to happen. But, you know. Nope! Um... I just... I can... The one thing that I think they could do, which would be an interesting twist, is Undertaker literally doesn't show next week. Really? Cena is shown in the front row right at the start of WrestleMania. And then Biker Taker music starts up. He bikes down the ring, goes around, stands in the ring, takes the chance, gets a mic, and goes, I'm here, John. Want a match? Sort of like the equivalent of when Brock and him had that face-off saying, you want to do this? You know, the UFC style thing? Oh, yeah. Have him just literally cold open. Because that would be, be an interesting, you know, you ended the last show, you're starting the next show with it because you know the pre-show matches don't happen <laughs> yeah that I think would be an interesting twist they're not going to do it Undertaker's showing up next week because Atlanta Georgia apparently needs the uh, the juicy juiciness or something but um, my honest feeling is also the thing to note as pointed out by many people Cena cannot do the Undertaker eyes thing. No, he can't. Because he was just doing weird shit with that. Um, he almost gave a face like he was really needing to fart really bad. You yeah, know? that very much. Um, but I, I like the tw- that they're being as heel as Cena can get without openly saying he's heel. I mean, the fact that he's copying Undertaker's moveset, even delivering the choke slam and everything, sort of is as close as they're getting to, wow, what disrespect from him by copying the Undertaker. They never said it, of course, because it's like, oh my God, he's channeling Undertaker, not realizing he's probably doing it on purpose to sort of goad and taunt Undertaker further. So. Yep. I'm going to score the main event actually a 3.5 out of 5. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a, a solid main event. Um, should have been better, though. Because we, we should have had some sort of payoff. Because I think one week build... You know, obviously they're doing some digs here and there from Cena's promos. But to me, it's just hiding the fact that can Undertaker actually go? Or are they worried he's just going to get injured again? You know, is he going to become Shane McMahon? And just like, last minute, well, he's injured. We have to rule this match out. Cena, you're actually legit sitting in the crowd. You just have to jump the barrier or something for the bloody Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. Well, time for overall score and thoughts. Overall, this week was an okay show. One part that I found funny was the exchange with Graves and Cole about his comments towards the ultimate deletion, and we would find out that the Woken One would be entering the Under the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. And just like the point Ashley brought up earlier in the review, with Asuka challenging for the SmackDown Women's Championship, the question remains of how long she'll remain on Raw before going to SmackDown exclusively, and one would think that possibly could happen after WrestleMania. Overall score of Raw this week gets a 3 out of 5 with best match of the night going to the main event with worst match of the night going to Elias vs. Rhino for the lack of interest in it. If it doesn't interest me, then how is it supposed to entertain me? Ashley, over to you. What's your overall score and thoughts on Raw this week? 2.75. It just, apart from bits here and there, which was pretty good, it just felt, it felt like a go-home show for a generic pay-per-view not Wrestlemania just felt like yeah that's a thing and whatever and like really that's how we're hyping up your biggest pay-per-view of the year by going oh yeah it's a, it's a thing you know I would say New Japan's doing it better but 
some would say that you know I'm I, I I'm still interested in it, but some would say that the card that they've just announced for the Sakura Genesis show uh, on Sunday is a bit of a letdown in itself. Um, possibly because they blew their load with the the LA show from this past weekend. You know, because like h- half the titles aren't even being defended. The, the problem, I guess, that they have is they've actually got major Kurokan Hall shows, which I guess is their equivalent of like, I guess, the Garden to some extent. You know, it's like the, the venue of history in Japan. Uh, they've got like two shows the following week after, I guess, Mania, because quite a lot of the Japanese guys are in America on the indies doing stuff because you know ex- expect the gossip then to pick up of uh, oh guess who's uh, being rumored to be going to WWE Kazuchika Okada because money <laughs> well guys and gals that's been our thoughts on Monday Night Raw this week what do we know from you guys out there the viewers and subscribers your thoughts on Monday Night Raw this week what are your overall scores and what are your thoughts on Raw this week definitely want to hear what you guys have to say be sure you put your comments in the comment section below if you guys like this video be sure you slam that like button like a champ and if you guys want to see more wrestling talk with awesome gameplays you know the two ways you got to do it you got to leg drop the subscribe button and hit that bell icon to turn on notifications that way you guys will never miss out on another video right here in my channel and also don't forget to support wgs tv on patreon so with that being said for the studly man ashley i'm your friendly neighborhood russell gamer reminding you guys out there to never be an obsolete you like michael cole